The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by speakers or guests on this podcast belong solely to them and do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, the moderators, or Deloitte. Welcome to Architecting the Cloud, part of the On Cloud podcast, where we get real about cloud technology, what works, what doesn't, and why. Now, here's your host, Mike Cavus. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Arctic in the Cloud podcast, where we get real about cloud technology. We discuss all the hot topics around cloud computing, but most importantly, with the people in the field who have done the work. I'm your host, Mike Cavus, Chief Cloud Architect over at Deloitte, and today I'm joined by an old friend, Jim Ford. Jim is Chief Security Architect, Head of Information Security at Cross Border Solutions. Jim, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about your background, and then we're going to get into some cool topics about cloud, Kubernetes, all that good stuff. Well, thanks, Mike. I appreciate you letting me come and pontificate with you. My, my career has been kind of a, a long meander. Uh, I started out, you know, doing things for uh, IBM and a satellite education world where the codec to encode our video would have been the size of a full rack. And that would, you know, we'd have a full rack at each end with full T's running just to get this video going, not the modern internet. Went from there to learn and support AIX and commercial Unix and C and went to ADP, built stuff for the internet, bought five of the first six internet products to market for them over a 24 year career. And as you know, we met when we were embracing Docker for containers and moving forward in the 2016 DockerCon where my friend Keith Fulton made the comment that we had chickens and needed chicken McNuggets on the application and made that. everybody in the place look going, really? <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was like, man, I'm hungry now. <laughs> I was glad he switched to the ice cream metaphor quickly. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's great to have you on here. Um, you gave me a lot of flashbacks when you went through your career. seems like everybody our age worked at IBM at some time for some reason. I don't know. Maybe that's all that there was back in the in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I got to tell you that, that it's really novel because now I, I've moved on to a, a recent startup or a, a tax modernization company that is innovating with serverless and cloud native on Amazon. And I was always, let's not get too close to any one cloud provider here. It's like, how deep can we go? How much can we consume yeah. higher up the stack? How can we avoid anything that looks like infrastructure? And since yeah. I'm doing security and compliance now, I love being able to point at the Amazon SOC 2 and the Amazon ISO and say, here, here's the basis of the bottom layer of my program. Yeah. Well, you know, we don't have all the legacy when you're building Greenfield. You can you can go up that stack. Is, and it's a beautiful thing. I feel bad for any company with legacy. <laughs> well, you know, it's an interesting topic. So, you know, my introduction to cloud was through a startup in the last maybe eight years has been all through consulting. So I'm dealing with really large enterprises and, you know, they keep talking about the locking and you got to be agnostic. And I keep going back to one example where, again, where start people say, well, that startup doesn't count, but forget about the company. Talk about the topic. We, we only had about, 10 folks and half of them were offshore just doing the UI. The rest of us were doing, you know, the middle tier and the transaction processing, which was all the work. And at the time we were on Amazon, RDS didn't come out yet or it was out, but it was beta and it wasn't to couldn't meet a requirement. So we spent, you know, the, the three guys who really built most of this stuff, spent all their time managing Postgres across region, across zones. It's a lot of work. And then RDS became real and we moved there and all that work went away and then we could actually do stuff that had value. Right. And, and yeah, I know and, and, and that's on. a great point because yeah. the question is, you know, Amazon and public cloud have the, the value prop of remove the undifferentiated heavy lifting. As we move up the stack, we start to say, well, what is undifferentiated heavy lifting? What do, what is my value add? My value add is not running infrastructure in the public cloud using IaaS. My, Right. My value add is not managing a Kubernetes cluster unless I have some strict regulatory requirement to run my own. You know, I, I can right. find use cases where it's valid, but realistically, anyone who's doing something net new is insane to take on that work. There's a fixed number of people who understand how to run Kube. Most of them are going to the cloud providers and the large engineering firms. 
If you're not one of them, what are you running Kubernetes for? You're basically pretending you know what you're doing. And that's dangerous. You're better off building functionality your users and business are paying for and that differentiates your value to the end user than building infra. Well, it provides value in two ways. You can call yourself a DevOps engineer and you can put Kubernetes on LinkedIn. Well, resume-oriented architecture. Yes, I understand (laughs) the term well. My resume needs to have Kubernetes. I'm going to put (laughs) Kubernetes out there. Roa, that's my new acronym. All right, so we're going to, the first question that (laughs) um, is going to be about an interesting article you wrote about, you know, it's called Decode or Not Decode. And it was really talking about the CTO level. And uh, when you wrote that, you weren't working for a startup. So it's going to be interesting if your answer matches the article now. But it was really talking about... Yeah, I was going to talk about the depth of, you know, should the CTO be hands-on keyboard coding? Should they be more governing, setting policies? Is it somewhere in between? So I'm not going to steal the thunder. I, Tell us about that article well, and your thoughts. Uh, sure. My, 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 I was smarting a little bit because I'd recently gone through some interviews and I was having a debate with uh, some folks over why it was important that uh, I should be current in a programming language and be able to sit down and write. A, a coding test in some language as part of a, you know, modern interview where it's 10 people in five hours or whatever. And, and my basic pretense is if you need somebody who's going to understand the cross-cutting concerns, the business touch points, the drivers, you need them to have coded. You need them to understand technology in a fundamental way. But, you know, we actually haven't invented much in the way of new technology since you and I started. We've replatformed it, we've re-implemented right. it, we've reimagined it. But what is a OCI compliant container? It's a modern version of IBM's LPAR, skinny down yep. to where I can put it on a thumb drive. You know, the, the, right. these things aren't new, they're just right. reimagined. <laughs> and we break that to be Sam tapes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so my main point is if you're going to lead a team of engineers to build a product and it's more than a startup where you're called the CTO because you're the third guy in, you, hey, you no, really I relate, have to I can relate to that. So, <laughs> well, you know, I, so, so I've, I've kind of refined my answer to an, it depends, right. but if you're to the point where your engineering team is more than about 15 or 20 people, your CTO should not be doing prototyping or production coding. They should be out doing some high level vision, high level direction, high level explanation, but they should not be the expert coder. Right, but they should be able to look at an architecture and call it BS. I, I agree. I'm not yeah. saying that you can go ahead and get somebody who's purely academic. Right, I'm right. not saying it's only a Visio architect. They have to have the chops. They have to right. have done the, the thing. But should they be current in it? You know, should I still right. be writing? Should I be writing JavaScript? Should I be writing .NET? Should I be learning Rust? Maybe, but most of my concern is in the pattern, the interaction, right. the metaphor, the pattern of how things are going to work together, how they queue, how they dequeue, how they scale. And, and that's not really down in the weeds of the actual code, in my opinion. Agree. The next topic is, you know, we're going back in today. It was always build versus buy, right? Do we build this or do we buy a package? But now we're in the cloud and it's all services. It's really, do we build or we consume? Yeah, so we, we have this dilemma today. Cloud providers have a ton of services and, and in the last two years, they're really moving up the stack beyond pass to business processes as a service, right? Sure. What are those decision points on, should I go up that stack and, and leverage these things versus it just doesn't have everything I need. Let me go build this. And there's consequences of both. So just, let's just talk about that for a bit. Well, well, l- l- let's start with the idea of is software ever done? This was the problem I always saw working in large enterprises that there's this idea that you're doing a project when the project's over, you redeploy those coders to go work on new stuff and they can forget about the old stuff. Nobody ever takes into account the maintenance and the aggregate debt that comes, the fact that there's replatforming and sunsetting of technology. and, And there's a lot of stuff that you end up getting screwed on in enterprises as you acquire more and more bespoke tooling in the quest to bit perfect. You know, there's companies out there that are still running homegrown CRMs, you know, so there's a value to it, but there's a danger to it. There's also a danger, even if you're just in consuming open source, 
because not all open source is created equal. And how do you recognize the difference between a rising sunset of a product and a waning sunset of one? You know, I, I think we have a real problem because we're good at adopting stuff. We're really bad about letting stuff go. <laughs> so when we look at the long tail of legacy in the data center from a company that's been around a long time, the, the modern company in the cloud isn't necessarily that much better if they're using something with a, a strange dependency chain. You know, we all live way up here in the abstraction ladder. We're not living down near the metal anymore. We're not in the days of command.com and, and NetBIOS. You know, we're, we're way up here in the I'm running an interpretive language on V8 in the browser, and it doesn't know anything about where it's running. Well, that means we don't, since we don't care, we don't know. And we're always amazed when we get, you know, compromised or intercepted or man in the middle, but we don't understand that layer three down there somewhere doesn't have the controls that everybody else had or, or whatever it is. So I think consume is dangerous when you don't understand what you're consuming, but I think focusing on business value is the most important thing people can do. And the least amount of code they can write to do that, the better off they are in the long run. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, that goes against the core of a lot of developers who love to write code, right? But uh, to me, the the architect is the one that figures out when not to write code. I, I had a guy, a very wonderful developer, and he used to argue with me all the time how the best code was no code. And I, I would fight him tooth and nail. And now I look back and I say he was a genius. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so talk about no code. Now there's no code, low code, right? And the first thing when this came out, I started thinking, man, world, I started thinking about Ashton Tate code generator for COBOL, how that was going to solve all our problems, right? It generated well, all the code. All, all the 4GL, see your, yeah. um, you know, uh, code to write code was the answer. Metadata was the answer, yeah. you know. Abstraction's the answer. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, and and then back to your comment where we we're good at you know adopting things, but we never sunset them. I was thinking maybe we should start our own reality show called the IT hoarder instead of the the hoarding thing. IT I, hoarding. We could we could keep that. We could have a lot of I, shows here. I I, I kind of wonder if we should start publishing a health index for you know open source projects and do some kind of a heuristic against. Uh, uh, contributors, rate of change, supportability, criticality, and, you know, come up with a score of, you know, red, yellow, green. Yeah, use these, get off those, because the community's moved on. It was only one guy to begin with, and he's moved. Okay, <laughs> what do we do? He retired, yeah. <laughs> so the next question, this goes back, like you said, we met at DockerCon after you guys' presentation. And back then, it was early days of... I'll say container 2.0 because container has been around forever, but Docker kind of made it a thing that people cared about beyond Linux kernel uh, mm -hmm. people. But so anyway, so you guys were early to the game adopting containers and back then the container orchestration war wasn't settled. So there were swarm and Mesos and Kubernetes. And like I said, you guys are an early adopter. You made some choices. So my question is, so that was 2016, which probably means you made those choices in 14 or 15. So we're talking about six years. Mm -hmm. Now we fast forward six years. Say you, you're still in 2015, but the technology fast forwards to 21. Now you have the choices you have today. You have all the cloud providers have containers as a service. Kubernetes kind of won. You know, where's Docker today? So with all that, how do you think, would any of that impact the decisions you made? And there's a point to this uh, once you answer that. Okay. Well, first, let's kind of divide the universe into two parts. What Docker did for us in 2014, 15 was it got the developers excited about the right once run anywhere. And really, it was the developer tools and the whole initial concept that got the developer mindshare that really enabled a lot of the shift to begin with. So, I think that plus the fact that the container image became an OCI format that was a standard that would run across a Kubernetes or a Mesos or a Cloud Foundry or whoever at that point, you know, so making the decision to go to containers would probably have stuck. Making the decision to use Docker tools for the devs very well may have stuck. I think Docker's big mistake was when they tried to do the build run part 
and move too far to the data center and try to make the ops folks happy too quickly. Because, you know, ultimately, Kube has kind of won that battle, and that's great. But I think that with Kubernetes, we run the same risk we ran when we built the data centers 30 years ago, that we're going to miss the wrong boundary for our security boundary. And I I know open policy agents are supposed to solve this, but, you know, eventually we're going to be running Kubernetes in the background. You're not going to know it's there. And there's it's not going to be a thing. Think about what, how Kube control captures everything on a command line. How long before we teach the AI what you do when you need to do it and take away the command line and make it so that, you know, the thing that comes beyond Kube just runs your stuff. Yeah. So... I think we would have done a lot of the same stuff. Would we have, you know, jumped straight to Kubernetes instead of Swarm? Possibly. Would it have saved some time? It might have made it faster. But I think ultimately the main decisions that were made were to break things down into containers and try to get the portability and to start isolating away from the VM. And I think that was valuable no matter what. And it allowed us to get to a unit of delivery and a unit of deployment that was much more self-contained and predictable. So I'd like to think we would have done most of the same things. We just would have done them better because the tooling would have been better. Yeah, so the the reason I ask, a lot of this has to do with the speed at which the cloud providers, even though we were talking about containers here, improve their APIs and actually add more features to it. So a few years back, we were working with a client, helping them move off of on-prem kind of packaged big data solutions to like AWS EMR, right? And one of the requirements was you need parity. And there's, you know, if, if you look at the whole Hadoop world, there's, you know, pig, high, there's all these things that get cobbled together, right? Yep. EMR didn't have all those things. There were certain things missing. So we were cobbling together all these things to give parity. And, and as we would get one solution, Jeff Barr would put a post that says, here's this, here's this part. And it, it was just keep happening. So a year yeah. later, you know, I think, I think uh, Amazon looked at the solution and said, what the heck are they doing? We got this, this, and this. Well, we didn't have that then. The point is, and like- we Rate of change. Start, yeah, the yeah. rate of change. And sometimes you have to acquire third-party solutions to fill a gap. And a year and a half later, you don't need that. And it goes back to IT Horton, right? That lives forever. So do architects today, as part of being fiscally responsible in the cloud, which includes shutting stuff off and be, you know making smart decisions- do they also have to be thinking about reevaluating decisions every year, 18, whatever that interval is, going back and looking, saying, is there value in taking out legacy? And legacies may only be two years now instead of 20 years. So I don't know. It's just It can be less than two years. And no, it's super valid. And, and the other challenge is that sometimes the cloud provider's solution is far superior. Right. You know, when I look at Fargate, or Lambda on Amazon today, they're all underpinned by Firecracker, which is the new micro VM that only supports three system devices. So it's immune to most of the x86 attacks that are leaky containers that most people still have are running. So, you know, you get benefits by moving to people who are focused on doing it at scale that you'll never get trying to do it yourself. And then you also have to probably get to the point where you're close enough to your cloud provider that you're getting the roadmap briefings and you're getting the NDA stuff so you can understand what is the stuff that you're really going to have to build because it's way out and how much of it can you be cranky customer on and and get Amazon to, you know, move. And, And it surprises me because you think of Amazon being so huge that they don't really listen, but they're actually pretty good at listening to the clients and what they're doing and seeing. And, you know, I think that going ahead and taking a a solution that might be possibly a little more expensive or a little more different than what you wanted by going with the PaaS layer or going with the managed service probably helps you in the long run because by getting into the ecosystem, by getting articulated into the tooling, when you want to turn on Redshift or a data lake or a new SageMaker model or some new add-on thing that you never had before, You don't have to go back and think about, oh, well, how do I index this? How do I access it? How do I address it? Because the cloud provider has stitched a lot of this together already. And if you're storing this stuff in your S3 already because you're using their XYZ service, well, then you can point, you know, Athena at it, or you can point something at it, consume that data again, 
and you start to get some of the benefits of, say, a LinkedIn does with their digital exhaust without necessarily having to plan ahead or doing a giant Kafka kind of situation that you'll, you know, become a, a, a Frankenstein of its own. You know, you kind of get that for free if you kind of buy into pieces of the ecosystem and then think about how things are being sequenced, consumed, and strung together. Uh, it used to be if you wanted to turn on a, a data analytics, data warehouse kind of project, you went to the board and asked for two million bucks. Yep. You know, then it became okay. Now I can go to the board and tell them I'm going to spend a hundred grand while we reformat the data through the data lake. If you're cloud native, quote unquote, and you're using a you know, RDS, or you're using an Aurora database, now you say, fine, tell SageMaker where it is and run. You know, now you're spending 20 bucks to find out, do you tell the board at all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Back in back in the day, late 90s, we built a data warehouse, probably 18 months we were, before a business could get their hands on it. Yep. And, you know, in the last few years, we can walk into a client and do a proof of concept in a data lake in, you know, three, four weeks. The, the real key here is that we have to remember that we have to push back and understand the business driver and understand the business pain. Because if we just become order takers and we build those bespoke yeah. monsters and we should say, well, if you can live with this until next Tuesday, I can get you that, which will give you 80 more percent of what you wanted, rather than trying to meet it all on some arbitrary deadline that somebody pulled out of uh, the ether. January 1. All my deadlines used to be January 1. I'm like, you know, I really I prefer, wanted to take time off around Christmas. <laughs> I prefer April 1. Yeah. Because then we can debate whether or not I was serious if I deliver or miss it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, man. Well, great catching up as always. Where can we find you? I know you got a lot of good content out there. Where can we find your blog and, and what's your Twitter handle and all that good stuff? Sure. You can find my blog when I do occasionally post it is on my website, www.paradolia.rocks. By the way, pareidolia is the habit of the human brain to see things that aren't there. So, you know, after a year and a half at home, pareidolia does yeah. rock. <laughs> <laughs> my Twitter handle is at Ford James C. And I'm on LinkedIn at uh, James C. Caldwell Ford. You can find me out there. All right. Thanks for your time. That's it for our episode of Arctic in the Cloud with Jim Ford. Learn more about Deloitte or read today's show notes. Head over to www.deloittecloudpodcast.com. You can find more podcasts by me and my colleague Dave Linticum just by searching for Deloitte on Cloud Podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Mike Cavis. You can always find me on Twitter, MadGreek65, or you can reach out to me, email at mcavis at deloitte.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Arctic in the Cloud. Thank you for listening to Architecting the Cloud, part of the OnCloud podcast with Mike Cavus. Connect with Mike on Twitter, LinkedIn, and visit the Deloitte OnCloud blog at Deloitte.com forward slash US forward slash Deloitte dash on dash cloud dash blog. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app.